Thank you. Um, just a very quick overview of Kobo for those of you not that familiar with us or where we've recently gone to. Uh, as of Valentine's Day, I believe we were 26 months old. Uh, we entered the marketplace in Australia back in May 2010 with Borders and Angus and Robinson, who live on as far as our customers are concerned uh, as Bookworld, owned by Pearson. Uh, we've added Collins as a retail partner in that period of time. Uh, we've upgraded our presence in the market uh, direct with Kobo, so we now do a lot of direct marketing through our, our own customer base, which has grown significantly in the last couple of years. Uh, and we've also added new device um, retailers uh, to our partners. So in the market now, we have a entry-level device with a, a button, that's the Kobo Wireless, that uh, is about $100. There's the Kobo Touch, which I think you can get for as cheap as $130, but retails for around $140. And then there's a tablet device that we released, released at Christmas, which we really haven't had a big push in this market yet. You'll see that in about April. And that's around $250, $260 at the moment. Uh, our retail device partners have also expanded because we've looked outside our traditional gene pool, of which the book industry looks in. Uh, we've partnered with JB Hi-Fi, Officeworks, um, Good Guys, Harvey Normans, and there's a few others. So a lot in the consumer electronics field and the, the leisure activity place. Um, our market share has slipped since entry. Uh, that's not surprising given that when we launched, there was just Amazon and ourselves really as significant players. But uh, our growth, uh, particularly after some content loading issues before Christmas, is now back into triple digits. Internationally, we operate um, with offices in uh, a lot of countries now. I think at last count, there's the UK, Spain, Germany, Holland, uh, Ireland, US, Canada, maybe even Luxembourg. Um, that might be a bit out of date though, and I'm travelling to Toronto shortly to find out what is on offer more. Uh, certainly we've got a big focus in Asia because at the start of this year we were bought by Rakuten, the uh, Japanese uh, online company. They have a partnership with Baidu, the Chinese Google, if you will. Um, they also have a partner with the number one Russian uh, internet player and a significant all the way through Southeast Asia. So you can have uh, you, there'll, there'll be quite a focus uh, down through Asia into this market over the next year. And uh, look, that, that purchase of uh, Rakuten saw Kobo go from a com company that was maybe rated at about $10 million in worth at startup to well over $300 million. So that's uh, quite a success. Now, that being said, we've learned a bit since then. So I'd like to quickly run through a few things about price. So what's in our catalogue? This is titles. And these are the price bins uh, across our entire catalogue of paid content, agency, wholesale and self-published. So you can see the expectation of the publisher where they're setting their prices, self-published, which is the blue at the bottom, and then wholesale. These are the wholesale prices, not the prices at which we sell the book because we do discount heavily. And as you can see, there's skews to popular price points that you should be aware of through um, a lot of conversations about what an e-book should be worth. And then, of course, I believe two years ago, Michael called the um, Michael Tamblin, uh, the executive, who's my boss, called the $21 plus price point the desert of uh, publisher hopes. So let's see why that is. And this is the actual sales uh, by Price Channel. And as you can see, obviously they're affected by availability, but you can't help but notice the um, the pricing at the very end of the graph there. Uh, how few of those titles actually. Uh, sell. The pricing bands are impacted obviously by discounting and promotion, uh, but the consumer is clearly using price as a driver for their selections, and it's something to keep in mind when looking at your books and uh, the way in which you price as to this essentially tells you what the consumer is expecting, because as you saw in the previous slide, our books range across all price points and very significantly past that. Now we do promotions, obviously. Uh, direct-to-consumer, in order to promote uh, new titles, we prefer a backlist-driven promotion. And this is our, our short term. And I'm, I'm just giving you one example. There are many, many different um, versions of promotions and the like, but we're asked to present some insights. So this is a cut down dramatically from that. This graph here shows you both market share uh, of total sales and market share without a promotion. So if we take a mid-list author, a mystery author, backlist of around 10. So they've obviously got quite a career. They have some level of profile, but they're not achieving bestseller status per se. 
The original price is $11. There's a one-month promo that's run before release of the new title, and that promo is run at a significant discount. That's designed to generate new readers for this author, but also on our site, because there are a discrete number of customers, that's to drive market share of that author across every purchasing decision. And for us, that's our biggest driver in promotions. It's not about price or, or many of the other things you might think, it's about market share. We see the success of a promotion being increased market share for the titles being delivered in that. So that gives you some idea of a, a direct impact. As you can see, without a promotion of that similar author, sales spike a little, but nothing like the, the spike that you see there, which is uh, graphically demonstrated. In the promo pricing, obviously there was a spike driven purely on value, but as you can see, it's not nearly as high, and even without the price-driven promotion, it's, uh, it's an amazing result for a new title, and that's been drawn out through partnerships with many of our local publishers who've been quite, I'd say, brave in helping us develop this kind of metric, who've made the decision to actually experiment with their titles, and this is a result of that. These are thoughts, which are not quite empirical, but nearly, so they're a little upgraded from guesses. Um, backlist is okay, but not too far back. No one wants to read, you know, backlist from back in the 50s and 60s uh, in, in this kind of aspect because it, it just doesn't work. It's a modern consumer culture. Now, backlist in the 50s and 60s that you classify as literature, I'm happy to have that discussion with you, but this is about driving volume and new titles. Better for mid-list than best-selling for a very obvious reason. Best-selling authors sell a lot of books. You're, not, you're looking to upgrade, obviously, but most people, their fans have already read. You get a a much smaller spike and you don't get that same increase in market share. Pricing is interesting. You don't have to hit 99 cents. Depending on what, uh, what pricing uh, result you want for your new release, you can actually hit much higher. 4.99 is where we like to sit. We've found it works best, but we have run these with 6.99 with varying success. We've also run them with 2.99 and 3.99. The consumer hasn't set on a price for value. Um, they have set on a price which they expect to pay, and we all are aware of what that is and what's been done to move that. That would be 9.99 set by Amazon, and that's been very effective at conditioning the consumer. There's uh, momentum for new release rather than energising the backlist. We're looking to get in, promote the new release title, and get out and sell that new release at as high a price as possible to maximise profits and volume for both of us. And the after effect, well. There isn't much in the way of aftershocks with this type of promotion. It's there when you can see it as it's been delivered to you, whether that's by direct mail, um, through a belly banner or whatever mechanic that you can choose to use. We have many. Um, these guys have many as well. Um, so one month is about it. Now, we're often asked, how much is a book worth? And I just thought I'd spend a minute on showing you how. We have a, an app. Um, uh, on our Facebook app, we, we have uh, a Reading Life uh, app which tells you how long it takes to read a book, how many page turns, when you read. It's quite fascinating. It's a little addictive. You may find yourself reading just to see how the um, stats change. But that does deliver us some very interesting information. Can we come up with a dollar value per hour for books? Because everyone is always saying that books are better value for money than the cinema and things like that. So let's see. So this is the average price of the book as sold across all our channels. This is the average time in hours on the final column that it took each reader to complete that book, which is when they sign off. And then the price per hour. So as you can see, these cheaper books, they tend to be self-published, smaller or promoted books. Excellent value for money. The HarperCollins title in the middle, A Dance with Dragons, a very, very big book. But again, I call that excellent value for money. 20 hours at 50 cents an hour. I think you're hard pressed to beat that. So all of that I would, I would call an argument for reading books. Except, of course, if you get to shit my dad says, <laughs> which costs you about as much as it costs to listen to it in real life. So that's my presentation. Thank you.